democratization of society. As of now, there are 21,000 Starbucks stores in over 65 out of 195 countries in the world. That amounts to over one-third of all the countries. This is how much Starbucks has grown over 43 years. But first, let's unravel the history of Starbucks. The first Starbucks opened in Seattle, Washington on March 30, 1971 by three partners who met while they were students at the University of San Francisco. English teacher Jerry Baldwin, history teacher Zeb Siegel, and writer Gordon Bowker. The three were inspired to sell high-quality coffee beans and equipment by coffee roasting entrepreneur Alfred Peake after he taught them his style of roasting beans. Originally, the company was to be called the Quad after a whaling ship from Moby Dick, but this name was rejected by some of the co-founders. The company was instead named after the chief mate on the Pequod, Starbucks. The first Starbucks cafe was located at 2000 Western Avenue from 1971 to 1976. This cafe was later moved to 1912 Pike Place Market, never to be relocated again. During this time, the company only sold roasted whole coffee beans and did not yet brew coffee to sell. The only brewed coffee served in the store were free samples. During their first year of operation, they purchased green coffee beans from Pete's, then began buying directly from the growers. The logo was designed by Terry Heckler. It features a twin-tailed mermaid, or siren, as she's known in Greek mythology. The siren was meant to symbolize the seductiveness of the coffee. In the first version, which was based on a 16th century Norse woodcut, the Starbucks siren was topless and had a fully visible double fishtail. The image also had a rough visual texture and has been likened to melasine. In the second version, which was used from 1987 to 1992, her breasts were covered by her flowing hair, but her navel was still visible. The fishtail was cropped slightly and the primary color was changed from brown to green as a salute to the alma mater of the three founders, the University of San Francisco. In the third version, used between 1992 and 2011, her navel and breasts are not visible at all, and only vestiges remain of the fish tail. The original woodcut logo has been moved to the Starbucks headquarters in Seattle. The vintage logo sparked some controversy due in part to the siren's bare breasts, but the temporary switch garnered little attention from the media. Starbucks had drawn similar criticism when they reintroduced the vintage logo in 2006. In January 2011, Starbucks announced that they would make small changes to the company's logo, removing the Starbucks wordmark around the siren, enlarging the siren image, and making it green. Starbucks wouldn't be what it is today if not for its CEO, Howard Schultz. goodness of coffee has now been captured in a cup. Before Starbucks, I think in the mid-70s, people were drinking really bad coffee. They were drinking instant coffee, Maxwell House U-Ban and perking it at home, and uh, it wasn't very good. <laughs> Your first cup of Starbucks coffee was? In the Pike Place store uh, in 1979, 1980, it was a French press of Sumatra. How much coffee is too much coffee? I drink about four to five cups of coffee a day. We just came for the day. To... You just came for the day. You're the highlight of our day. Oh. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Thank you for your compliment. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. When I came here for the first time, I had never been in a Starbucks store. Walked into this very store. And by the way, we have changed nothing through the years. This is the original store as is. And they handed me a cup of coffee made this way. Now this is a cup of Sumatra, which is Indonesian coffee, 
this is how I tasted my first cup of coffee. And I just knew from that moment on that I was home. Did I ever imagine that we would one day have stores in 65 countries serving almost 80 million customers a week? No. Growing up in Brooklyn in the projects in the early 60s, what I would loosely describe as the other side of the tracks, provides a deep sense of understanding that there's a world out there that's uh, very, very different than the world that is inside where we, where we grew up. And I wanted to be part of that world. New beverages that no one ever heard of. No one heard of a cafe latte before. I raced home to talk to the founders about the experience I had, and they rejected it. Over a period of two years, I left Starbucks to start my own chain of Italian coffee bars. At that time, Starbucks found itself in uh, financial difficulties. And so the founder came to me and said, I can't think of Starbucks in better hands than if it was in your hands. I, I realize you don't have the money. I'll give you X amount of time to try and find it. I was able to buy Starbucks in August of 87. They had six stores at the time for $3.8 million. I didn't, at that point, have an understanding that coffee would one day become part of the culture or the zeitgeist in ways that I couldn't possibly understand or predict. I think we realized early on that what we had to do is everything had to prove itself in the cup. The ability to source and roast the highest quality Arabica beans in the world gave us the platform to do things that would define and build an industry that did not exist. Many people at the time were convinced Starbucks was too strong. and We had to educate the market and the customer about, no, this is what coffee should taste like. And there you have it. Starbucks has even penetrated tea drinking countries in Asia. As a matter of fact, its first branch outside of the U.S. is in none other than Tokyo, Japan. And the city with the highest number of Starbucks branches is Seoul in South Korea. Surprisingly, China has the third highest number of Starbucks branches. In order to successfully globalize Starbucks, the company adapted strategies such as licensing, franchising, and finding the right local partner. For China, Starbucks partners include Meita Coffee Company, Uni President, and Maxim Skaters. Starbucks aimed to introduce the general public to the intricacies of coffee, capitalize on the tea drinking culture of the Chinese consumers by introducing beverages using popular local ingredients such as green tea and traditional Chinese items such as festival mooncakes, curry puffs, and sausage rolls and of course to use the Chinese calendar to promote their coffee. In China, the first Starbucks branch was in a hotel at first, but then it moved to Beijing World Trade Center. Starbucks has done a really good job of creating a relationship with their customers that is both unique and personal, where frequent customers can feel like they are part of the in-crowd. One of the main ways Starbucks creates this crowd of Starbucks people is through language. The Starbucks lingo is a huge part of the Starbucks lifestyle and the Starbucks experience. If a person goes into Starbucks and they don't understand what a macchiato is, or how to pronounce venti, or the different kinds of milk available, they are not part of the in crowd. But the baristas are helpful in this department, so after a couple of visits, that person should be on their way to being a Starbucks person. The baristas do their best to give quality service to their customers, especially to the regular ones. As much as possible, they try to become familiar with the customers' names. They serve the beverages with smiles. And that's why the most important criterion of Starbucks for hiring baristas is their personality. Even the type of drink a person chooses factors into their sense of identity. Some people are espresso people, while others are latte people. And it acts as a kind of subcategory to their overall Starbucks identity. Large corporations like Starbucks have been the reason for our globalized alienation. But at the same time, Starbucks in particular has become a place for relief and interaction with others. The influence Starbucks has had as a global corporate identity is due to the fact that they sell more than just coffee. They sell a lifestyle. This lifestyle is projected onto their customers subtly, 
by means of their local design and the rhetoric they use. The many choices Starbucks has made over the years to promote itself have been successful. Its brand identity transcends the coffee itself. Starbucks even offers souvenir items like packed coffee beans, coffee mugs, tumblers, planners, and others. It has also become a tradition for Starbucks lovers to collect these items. Starbucks has truly evolved into more than just a coffee brand. It has become a part of society's culture. Why do you let me stay here?